I'm here today with Eloise Skinner, who is an author, a therapist, a founder and a teacher. Born on a council estate in East London, she later studied at Cambridge, trained at Oxford and practised as a lawyer in the city. But after some soul searching, including a year training to be a monk, she followed her passion into psychotherapy. She's the author of The Purpose Handbook, which is published by Pratt's Conservation Publishing, and her newest book, But Are You Alive?, is an exploration of depth, meaning and fullness in everyday life, incorporating teachings across existential therapy, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, well-being and monastic spirituality. There's a phrase I don't say very often in this intro. <laughs> Hello, Eloise, it's good to see you. Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here. And I mean, we started off a little bit there with your own journey, which I think is is fascinating and enlightening. Tell us a little bit about what you've embraced in the last couple of decades. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, quite a few different types of things. So I started my career in <clears throat> quite a traditional way um, in corporate law. And I really always thought I wanted to be a lawyer from quite a young age. So I was quite set on going to law school and then practicing as a lawyer in the city. And yeah, I went straight into corporate law after university and did that for about five years. But during that time, I also started doing a range of other things, like started writing and speaking. And what I really enjoyed doing was sort of communicating concepts to like other people, to other junior lawyers. And I really wanted to write more and speak more um, and do more teaching with them. Um, so I ended up writing originally for a publication called The Lawyer Magazine. Um, and then after a few years, I wrote my first book, which is called The Junior Lawyer's Handbook um, for the Law Society. And as I was doing that, I started to become a little bit more interested in the writing and speaking side of things and sort of learning new concepts and new ideas. And alongside that, I was sort of exploring the bigger ideas of life, like um, I'm sure as many people do in their 20s, like what is the point of everything? What is the point of what I'm doing? What like what is the meaning of this? Um, is this the right career for me? What are my values? Like who am I as a person? And alongside my sort of legal and my writing work, I went on a bit of a deeper journey into like what is this all for um and that led me to become a yoga teacher to train in meditation and mindfulness um and to spend a year in a monastic community um in london training essentially as a what they sometimes call as a millennial or a modern monk um and yeah so then during the pandemic i had a little bit of a career change i came out of law and wrote my second book the purpose handbook which is published by practical inspiration and after that more teaching, more learning. Um, I stepped more into psychotherapy. So I did my psychotherapy training. Um, and now I specialize in existential therapy, like meaning and purpose. And now the third book. <laughs> that is where we are. I always struggle to make that sound like a linear path because it was very like... <laughs> <laughs> and existential therapy, for those who don't know, is this logotherapy or is this different? What's Yeah, yeah, it's... um. A really evolving field so I guess logotherapy was maybe um maybe like the foundation of some of these ideas and this is based around Viktor Frankl's work Viktor Frankl who most people will know from a book called Man's Search for Meaning um and he was a psychiatrist a psychotherapist before um the holocaust and had already developed these kind of ideas of logotherapy which were about the will to find meaning in in people's lives um and sort of this new type of psychotherapy which didn't necessarily always have to be for people who were experiencing like um something wrong or like something an issue let's say in their lives but could also be sort of just a helpful tool or like a preventative measure to help people find a sense of meaning and purpose in everyday life um and he had a, a, an experience in the concentration camps during um nazi germany and on Very the much side, stress tested his ideas exactly um a sort of real life exploration of his principles and then coming out the other side, wrote this book called Man's Search for Meaning. And the book is really divided into two sections. So you've got his autobiographical reflections on his experiences. And then the second half of the book that um, I think maybe a lot of people either skim over or um, flick through quite quickly is more like a technical description of what logotherapy really is. Um, and that's where the field maybe um, you could say the most popular foundations of the field are in that book. And then... Other than that, there are lots of different fields of like existential therapy and existential analysis, which is the specific field that I train in, which draw on these ideas, but sort of make them a little bit wider or broader or more holistic in some cases. So 
um, Viktor Frankl was maybe like the foundational principles and then there are lots of other ways of interpreting them um, and still very much an evolving field. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that's always struck me about you and about the conversations that we had, you know, as you were preparing to write um, your, your second book and so on, is is the way that you you interrogate the meaning purpose so that there's a real spiritual and, and, and sort of, you know, rigorously intelligent dimension to that as well. And you bring in work and performing well at work and you bring in the body and feeling well and being the best you can be physically. Mm-hmm. Just talk me through that's I mean that's an awful you seem like you're focusing everywhere you know everything all at once <laughs> and, and that being really important to actually being everything that you can be so tell me a bit more about integration and the de- different spheres of life yeah I love this idea of integration I think it's been really important to me um on my journey towards meaning and purpose and I've always seen finding a sense of meaning and purpose in your life as a component of like being well or being whole yeah. or like being as I described in the new book as being like fully alive and I'm not really sure like entirely if that like what that means or if that has like a I don't think it has a set definition for everyone I think it's more like a personal journey that everyone goes on to find like what is the fullest and deepest and more most um, fulfilling experience that I can have of my life Um, But I think for me, that process has been really around trying to bring in like the mind, body, work, career, like relationships, everything sort of coming together to make you who you are as a a person. And I think probably that's quite informed by my spiritual background, like the training that I had in a monastic community where really the purposes of those communities are to bring your whole life together together towards one greater purpose Um, and so then when you step out of that and you think okay here's a book on career confidence or here's a book on like eating well or here's a book on like um you know like mental performance those are all great but they're like parts of a greater Mm -hmm. whole and I think for me the journey has been about trying to like bring some of those things back together well you talked about feeding into the the latest book so let's just interrogate that a bit more that title but are you alive it's such a I mean, there's a visceral reaction to that isn't it? you can't hear that type. I mean it, you, in your way you're using the power of the question that kind of instinctive elaboration to immediately get somebody answering it for themselves where did that come from and what I guess what do you want to achieve with that challenge to the reader mm. yeah um it's a great title and um just shout out to Jamie who we both know <laughs> for like coming up with the final formulation of that title which good job is, Jamie yeah, excellent work Jamie um we had like been playing around with um a few ideas and we've really got to this sense of like you know when you're trying to name a book you're like what is the core thing going on in this book um and like what is an idea that kind of encapsulates all of it and so we played around with a lot of these ideas of like integration wholeness was a word that kept coming up um wellness fullness and then fundamentally this idea of aliveness um and yeah the the title I think is a little bit confronting um it's like maybe a bit intimidating for me to put that title in a book because I feel like wow who am I to be asking such a big question but I feel like it's not really me asking it of the reader but the reader asking it of themselves kind of thing um or like a question that invites like a deeper exploration um, and I love the idea of it being a question because, like you said, I think the questions are often the most important things. And really, my whole approach as a teacher and as a psychotherapist and even as a lawyer, really, maybe this comes back to law school at the end of the day, is like you don't ever really have like a final answer. It all really depends on like the circumstances and your lifestyle and who you are and where you are in your life. And so the, maybe the best thing you can do is gather the questions that are going to help you and then work from there. And that concept of aliveness, I mean, if I were responding as a lawyer, I'd be, well, it depends what you what you define as alive. Wow. <laughs> Check it straight back at you. But in a, I guess in a sense, what, what is your kind of fullest experience? If you were to define what it means to be fully alive today, how would you articulate that? Yeah, and I think it is such a, pers- like you said, it's a very personal question. Um, so what what it means to be fully alive will be different in my life than it will be for yours or anyone who's listening and again it will be different from time from season of life to different seasons of life and you know depending on what you're focusing on and 
it's always going to be evolving and always shifting. So um, the approach that I take in the book where at the very beginning I discuss like what does that actually mean and sort of don't really reach a, <laughs> don't reach a set conclusion. Um, but for me, I guess it has connotations of a real deep experience of everyday life. So I have often felt this sense um, in previous years of like just being on the, like stuck on the surface of life a little bit. And like this feeling of like floating around, like everything's moving really fast. You're just like scrolling through social media, like you're sort of moving from one step to another of your life um, without like really feeling like you're in it. And I had that experience for quite a long time when I was in my, um, just coming into my first years of my corporate career where I felt like, okay, here are the goals of life and you're sort of like moving through them and you're getting there. Um, but it doesn't, I never felt like I was actually in, <laughs> in the experience of life, uh, which sounds quite strange, but um, it's sort of, I guess a feeling of like a little bit of disconnection from the present or like what's actually going on in the present moment. So for me personally, aliveness is like depth, it's present moment awareness, it's being fully here, it's being embodied, it's like feeling well, it's having a sense of meaning, um, and yeah, just feeling this like full sense of life. Um, That's a great way of articulating. I love that. And that point about being on the surface all the time, because it's so easy to do that, isn't it? Uh, that there's enough to fill your day. There's enough that you don't actually have to kind of proactively do or think anything because there's content there to scroll. There's jobs to be done. You can fill your day without ever going below the surface mm. if you want. <laughs> I'm really interested. It's a very leading question, this, and I'm not even sorry. Mm. One of the things that I find writing does for me is is anchors me down. It makes me stop just floating with the current and, and forces me into a deeper articulation of my ideas or a deeper experience of, of the present or a deeper reflection on what I'm doing. I'm going to throw that back mm. to you. What does writing do to mm. you? Yeah, and um, I will happily accept that leading question because I think we share the same appreciation of writing and its tools and obviously we've worked together quite a few times over the years and like we have always whenever I've worked with you we've always done like writing exercises which I have really enjoyed you introduced me to um free writing back in the day where I'd never done that thing of like writing just getting all your thoughts out and then like reflecting back on it and um I'm a huge fan of writing and as well of like practical exercises and like putting little things into the book that are quite like practical and useful like a little tool that you can try out that's really what um like you said anchors me um back down into the everyday moment um but to come to writing specifically I think for me it feels very grounding to write because when you just have stuff sort of like floating around in your head or like you know you're thinking about a lot of things your mind is going really fast um it can feel really overwhelming it can feel like you know it's hard to conceptualize what you're actually thinking or feeling unless you either talk about it which I guess is like the psychotherapy method um or you can write it down which is another form of like sort of working through and I think as well as writing down also reflecting on the things that you're so I'm a big fan of like writing a lot and also then looking back and seeing like oh where are the themes where are there like consistencies what are the things that are coming up again and again um and then seeing what that can that can teach you but and there's writing that you do for yourself like that. And then there's writing mm. books. You do mm. both. You've written three books now that I yeah. know of. Just three? Yeah, just three. Yeah, just three. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you have like, a, this is how I write a book. I have an operations manual for this now. Or is it, <laughs> has it been different each time? Or, you know, what would you do next yeah. time? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think um, I'm definitely getting, am I getting better at, at, at the writing process? I don't know. I think um, you've got to really know your topic I mean that sounds a bit obvious but um I think you've got to really have lived something and like sort of not necessarily be the world leading expert in something but if you're writing about something you know when I wrote a book for junior lawyers I had just been through the junior lawyer experience so I felt like okay I have the information and also I've just literally lived that experience so I can now communicate those concepts um same with the purpose handbook like that came straight out of a decade of finding purpose and with this book again like from my psychotherapy training so I think you've got to have the sort of expertise and then in terms of the writing process I find that quite satisfying because a lot of it is about organization like how are you going to set this out like what are the ways you're going to work through this in a practical way I really like structuring things um so I love the table of contents doing that work um and then I actually maybe I think this was a tool that I picked up when we worked on the purpose handbook but um 
you have your table of contents, you have all the sections within the table of contents, and then you break them down into individual word limit sections, and you just write those. And that is, I definitely did that again with this book, it's like, just knowing you have to write 500 words on this topic, and that's it, like, that's all you have to do. And that's doable, right? You Absolutely do doable and not intimidating and like completely realistic. And I just think that's the best. That's one of the best tools that I use. <laughs> I'm so <Thank> glad. <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't work for everybody. Nothing works for everybody, but it works for yeah, most people. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yeah. So you've got your process. You've got, you've got, you know how you write a book. There's lots more to being an author than just the writing the book, isn't there? There's the whole what do you do with this book now? You've got to do the whole marketing hoopla. You are um, amazing on social media. And I know it's not your favourite thing in the world. So if, if you're happy to, I'd love to talk about that. You know, what, what, why is it such a necessary evil? And, and what's the best way of just, you know, getting through yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> wow. I could say so much on this topic. Maybe maybe this is my next book on why, or why it's so difficult. But um, I think it's a real struggle for authors now because social media is really the primary maybe the primary place that an author can communicate with their um with new readers at least even if you have an established base like somewhere else or you know if you come from a different form where you already have an audience like built in um maybe that makes it a little bit easier i know a lot of people are moving over to substack which i will also be doing at some point of like then you can build a bit of a writing community and i've been told by many many people like you need to get on this now it's much better than social media in the sense that you can really communicate like more directly with people but um Substack aside, I think, you know, to have a presence on Twitter, Instagram, um, TikTok, whatever, um, has become sort of really, really important to the success of a book, whether it's you promoting it or whether it's your pub. I know some authors like that, their publisher do that work. And I think it's really difficult and challenging because as an author, you're not necessarily the best person to then like put your face out there and like talk to people about the ideas that you've written down like they're two quite different forms of you know, yeah very different yeah. skill sets and um it can be frustrating because you really want to share it you've, you've written a good book you've focused a lot of energy and effort on like high quality writing and then you have to then make a little video a like 10 second video or like lip sync something that communicates the concept perfectly and it's just it's tough and I personally find it very like draining emotionally and like personally to be on those kind of platforms and to put that work out there um and quite intimidating to be honest to like put myself out there like that consistently um so I don't know if I have the the solution for authors who are also <laughs> who are also struggling other than the things that have helped me are to be very structured about it to know all right this is part of the work of the book to put it out there um, and I um, have worked with a coach in the past who used to tell me things that have been very helpful, like um, it is your responsibility to the book to try and communicate its concepts out there. If you believe it is that helpful, you need to like be sharing it with people. These are the things that I like repeat to myself every day as I prepare to post one thing on Instagram. Um, but also to know like what you need to do. I need to make a video. OK, that's just a task. I need to do that task and then I will step away from that task that it doesn't become overwhelming um and then yeah to stay and this comes back I guess to the meaning and purpose side of it is like you know what is the purpose of you might hate this little particular thing that you have to do but like what is the purpose of it well that's to share the idea of the book and I think it is going to be helpful and I want it to reach someone who like me would have been looking for that book and that person might be on Instagram so now I feel like okay I gotta do my Instagram yeah and you do it very, very well. I'm going to put the links up on the show notes as well. I mean, it does help when you are you know, a ballet dancer and a yoga teacher and you can do some really good Instagrammable stuff. Not every writer has that at their disposal. Yeah, that sometimes does confuse things, though, because then you have a little bit of brand identity of people like, oh, I thought you were just like doing the splits or something. And now you're to work. So it's all a bit of a nightmare, but who knows. But uh, hey, it's all... It's all bringing people in, isn't it? And you know, at least they're going to get some good stuff out of that. So if I was to ask you, Eloise, with your, it's a really substantial book writing experience now. What's the one tip that you would give to somebody who is just starting out on this journey? What would you say to them? I would say, I'd say good luck. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> um, yeah, good luck. Good luck with it. Um, no, I'd say it's a really exciting time to be starting out on the journey. I think it can be a, an incredibly personal experience to 
write a book like it teaches you a lot about yourself and so I would say yeah enjoy it and my best tip would be to share your ideas like quite widely and maybe before you feel like you're ready to share them not necessarily like publishing an extract or whatever but sharing it with other people getting their feedback getting their thoughts and that has been so helpful for me and something I always always try and do is like even if it feels uncomfortable even if you hate it even if you're like cringing if like the more you can talk to your to people to your potential readers about your ideas the like the more you're going to hit that point where you can communicate in the way that you know people are going to receive it in the way that you want it to be received and I think because I have a bit of a business school background as well that was like number one thing when you're making a product or like developing a service is like you've got to find the market for it and like who actually wants this and why and so I think to apply that to a to a book or a business book um it's about finding like who is going to read that book and to the extent that they really want that problem whatever you're trying to offer them they really want that solved so much that they're going to look at your book and think okay that solves or that helps my issue um and a lot of that is about like communicating with potential readers and figuring out what their problems are and how you can help them it's a brilliant point in a sense every book is a startup isn't it and Mm, you you have to do that that work with it and (laughs) just a little less uh less expensive than most startups yeah 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 maybe a bit less stressful as well because you can um, a little bit well maybe (laughs) spending yeah and actually it's a good analogy isn't it because for many startups a book is the fullest expression of the intellectual property behind that or the, the approach that it embodies so it's it's a good partner for any kind of um initiative that you're launching on the world it forces you to think it through at the very least yeah definitely and i think um once you get over the initial hurdle of sharing it mm. becomes so much easier once you've had a few people then it becomes much more comfortable to be you know to share more broadly and yeah your ideas become so much more refined when you are communicating them with others I yes. think and I love that point about even if it's especially when it feels uncomfortable that that's mm. when it's most important to do it isn't it otherwise you've got too comfortable in your ideas and that's not a good thing it's great yeah, yeah. and I always ask my guests as you know to recommend a book as well that, that think listeners should read you're not allowed to recommend are you alive the purpose handbook or the junior lawyers handbook or anything <laughs> sorry but <laughs> what book do you think that um has really helped you and, and would, you would pass on to other people? Mm, I think I would, I mean, this is maybe a little predictable. I think I would have to say um, a Viktor Frankl book. So maybe Man's Search for Meaning, I think is a really nice introduction to um, some of the ideas, the second half of the book and the first half of the book, obviously incredibly moving and personal experience. So it's, a, it's an interesting mix of like something that's incredibly engaging and also something that introduces the reader to like some more um technical theories that's actually quite an interesting structure for a book i don't think i've come across many books that are like Mm. half autobiography and half um technical theory so it's a nice way to sort of explore the ideas of logotherapy without um feeling too like you're reading a textbook or um feeling too intimidated by it but i think those ideas they can be helpful in businesses they can be helpful if you're a writer they they're just helpful ideas to have (laughs) in your portfolio it's a very good point. Had Victor Frankl come to me, I would have probably said, Victor, you've got two books here. But yeah. thank goodness he didn't and he didn't wouldn't have listened anyway. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean it's interesting. I would be interested to know if there's another I'm gonna go on the hunt for books that have done that again. <laughs> it's a book of two halves. Yeah, love it. Brilliant. Great recommendation, thank you. And if people want to find out more about you or about the new book, where should they go? Uh so my website's probably the best place, which is eloiseskinner.com. And other than that, social media, I'm on there confusingly as at Eloise Alexia. Um, but if you just type my name into any social media uh, search engine, you should be able to find it. And I'll put up Instagram and TikTok. Those are the two. Oh, well, yeah. TikTok still going on there. Still going. Um, but yeah, Instagram, TikTok and uh, LinkedIn. If you and LinkedIn. Brilliant. I'll put those links up on the show notes, as always, at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com. Absolute joy to talk to you today. Thank you so much. We just scratched the surface of the stuff that we could have had a conversation about, but it's been really fun. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, such a helpful podcast that has helped me a lot in the past as well. So I'm honored to be here. Oh, good. <laughs>